Good afternoon. I'm Dara Bunjan. I'm the food enthusiast. If this is your first time joining the show, I am a food writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. Today's show is brought to you by Amidus. Amidus Recovery Centers offers premier treatment for drug and alcohol addiction and co-occurring mental health disorders in facilities across the country. To learn more about the treatment programs, call 833-631-0525. Addiction is treatable and recovery is possible. And just to let you know, when you see me looking offside, I am watching on my computer to see if you have any questions and please feel free to send in your questions or comments. So I am just doing it with the computer because I can't see it on the phone while doing the show. Today's guest is James Beard, nominated food writer, cookbook author of 14 cookbooks, cooking teacher, and vocal activist for racial and social equality, both in North Carolina and throughout the nation. Her recent cookbooks are The Fruit Cookbook and The Walk and the Skillet. Let's welcome Nancy McDermott. Hi. Hi, Nancy. Oh, Dara, um, Dara, it's so good to be in your kitchen, my kitchen. Yeah, I'm in your kitchen a lot. You do a lot of shows. Have you had your rice today? Not yet. Use, that's usually supper. Breakfast is raisin bran and lunch is tomato sandwiches this time of year, but rice for dinner so much. <laughs> Well, you know, I brought up the rice because you spent many days in Thailand for the Peace Corps when you came out from college with your English degree. And that was where that pension for a lot of your Asian cookbooks came from. And Absolutely. that was sort of the way people greeted each other, wasn't it? That's exactly um, right. And it's and it's it's true in Thailand. It's also true in China and Thai Thai language and culture has a a Chinese and an Indian and Laotian uh, bent. So that, that way of using rice as a synonym for food and eating, like even if you had a bowl of noodles, you'd still say, yes, I've had my rice because it means food. It's, there's a satisfaction and a comfort to it that doesn't make sense if you just take a bowl of unseasoned rice and take a bite of it. But when you live there, it, it really starts to make the, the whole cuisine makes sense. And, you know, people love it even if they don't live there. So it, it needs no introduction. Well, you have, I'm just trying to read here. Let's see. Real Thai, quick and easy Thai, quick and easy Chinese, 300 stir fry, simply Vietnamese, quick and easy Vietnamese, vegetarian Thai, curry, and your most current Asian book is Walk and Skillet. Can you tell us more about that book? Actually, Walk and Skillet is actually a, a re, it's, it's not really a reissue. It is the 300 best stir fry recipes book with a new uh, cover. So it's, it's like a beauty makeover. It's still me, but, but I, you know, a new hairdo, new lipstick. So they shot a new cover and they renamed it because, you know, looking at SEO and I think no one was Googling, what are the 300 best stir fry recipes, but using a wok and cooking with a skillet uh, resonated. So, so they just... It, it's in, I don't, it's, it's been through many printings. And when the last printing came up in late 2019, they sent an email and said, Hey, here's a new cover. What do you think? And I said, Whoa, cause it's, it's really beautiful. And I think it, I think it positions the book well for home cooks who, you know, want dinner and want something that's, you know, not just the, you know, whatever your usual rotation is. And it's, um, it, it, it's about making dinner using a way of cooking that is Asian, that is traditional, but it's, it's really very, um, it's user friendly, I guess I'd say. Um, you somewhere in the notes, cause I've spent a lot of time, not that we aren't acquaintances and things of that nature, but I learned a lot about you when you decided to be on the show. And um, there was some talk, coconut plays an important part, not only in Asia, but in Southern cooking. So um, yeah. can you tell people the difference between an old coconut and a new coconut? Ab absolutely. And in Thai, they call them uh, mature. So, it, so it's young, new, and mature, like wise. 
And so the only coconuts that we see, I'd say, in the grocery store and that that Southerners who cook with coconut, usually in a sweets context, uh, the only ones we're going to see are the mature ones, the old ones. And fresh off the tree, they're huge. They're bigger than a football. They're round. They're covered with a soft, a very fibrous, soft um, green outside um, covering. It's a giant nut. And so the coconut that we see is that little brown hard center. So it's kind of like the black walnut inside that great big ball. If you've ever seen a, you know, a black walnut falling off the wild black walnut tree and they are the, the peel, the, the, the flesh of a coconut when it is green and new is soft. It's, it's like tofu only sweet and delicate and the liquid is fresh. And I mean, it's a, it's something that people feed to babies and to invalids, people who are compromised because it's, you know, it's a wild, falls off the tree onto the ground, and yet it's completely sanitary. It's completely healthful. Um, and, but as it gets older, that, that white outside gets hard, and the liquid is, it's not delicious. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt you, but people in Asia don't consider the liquid inside a mature old coconut to be worthwhile. So they whack them open with a machete or the back of a cleaver and scrape out that hard uh, meat and grate it. And that's what my grandmother, you know, my first coconut I had was coconut cake uh, on my grandmother's dairy farm. And she was a great cook. I mean, you know, in in olden times, most women had to cook. It was it was required and it might not be any more of a pleasure than, you know, laundry or or vacuuming, but it was required. But she loved it and was really good at it. And I remember my grandfather helping her with the coconut. She would make it at Christmas and then she would make it uh, for the family reunion. Actually, in the olden days, she only made it at Christmas because they weren't available. Coconuts would be brought up from the tropics, from the Caribbean, and like oysters and um, uh, other shellfish would be available during the cooler months. So that coconut cake, I remember my grandfather with a hammer cracking it open and you know putting a hole in one of the eyes to shake out the liquid. And then she would grate it on her meat grinder, the same one she used for making sausage. Yes, that's what that's what they did. I'm I, still I, here. I read that. <laughs> she lived into her 80s. Yeah, you know. It's kind of like nobody driving got around. sick. <laughs> no, nobody got sick. It's like it's like driving around with, with I wouldn't say, hey, my grandmother didn't use seat belts. I'm not going to either, but it was another time. And now I like to duplicate that by putting coconut to get that texture, that sort of nubby little bits texture, not a right. shred. I put it, I drop uh, diced uh, peeled white coconut down into my food processor with that, with the basic blade running and it chops it up just perfectly. So, you know, you, you improvise. It's, it's, it's traditional, authentic. You know, you don't want to cook Thai authentically. You don't want to probably have a charcoal stove that you have to fan in your kitchen when you've got this other stove. So, so food changes and food evolves. And the Thai food that I knew when I was in Thailand as a Peace Corps volunteer it's still there and yet it's not, you know, it's like a New York deli. It's still the same, but it's not everything. I, I, I think the, the ever evolving stories of food and what people eat and why they eat it and how it changes is fascinating. And I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with the focus that we tend to have on what's new, you know, what's hot, what's not, and who invented this, who owns it. And um, you know, that we're, we're sort of on a, right, wrong, good, bad, win, lose mentality in food sometimes. And I think it's like, wow, look at all the different ways there are to make cornbread and not making somebody wrong because they put X or Y or don't in their cornbread. It's easy to well, be the police and that's not good for food. So. Yeah, well, you're sort of a food sleuth anyhow. I remember <laughs> yes. um, somebody asked you uh, some information about a lane cake. That's L-A-N-E, a lane yes. cake. And I went, I don't know what. I've never heard of that. Um, and that was from, um, what, To Kill a Mockingbird? Well, yeah, it's mentioned in To Kill a Mockingbird. There are five cakes that are mentioned in To Kill a Mockingbird, a pound cake, coconut cake, lane cake. Can't remember what the other ones were. But when my daughter was in high school and read it for her ninth grade English class, um, I reread it at that time and noticed the cake. So for their um, presentation day, I made all five of those cakes and took them in in a, in a, a, a very shoddy uh, effort to make sure she got an A. I'm sure she would have anyway, but no, it was, it was, you know, it was just fun to look at. And it's like, oh, well, every woman in town is going to be walking up Atticus's step, um, 
uh, sidewalk carrying a lane cake because that was a way to, you know, endear yourself. Uh, but it's, I mean, I could, I could talk about a lane cake for 45 minutes and you don't want to know that much about it, but it's a deep South cake that has coconut and raisins and pecans inside and that fluffy white icing. And I would say, you know, I didn't hear of it until To Kill a Mockingbird. It's not, it wasn't big in North Carolina. Within the South, there are regions just like within, you know, with any, within British cooking or within Jewish cooking or, you know, within German cooking, there's all kinds of ways that people do it here and there and all those stories. I, I am, you said a sleuth, I, I am a detective and that's my favorite part is getting interested in something and tracking it down and finding things that aren't linear that maybe everybody doesn't know about it, but how do things connect? Cause that's always, a, it's a story of culture and movement and ingredients. And oftentimes it's a story of sorrow and war. And sometimes it's a story of celebration and success. And I never get tired of it. Before I forget everybody, we're here with Nancy McDermott, cookbook author, and you can find her and information at her webpage, Nancy McDermott, and that's N-A-N-C-I-E McDermott with two T's at the end of it. On Facebook, Nancy McDermott, Twitter at Nancy's Table, and Instagram, Nancy Mac Pick, P-I-X. And um, the fun thing is really go and try to be her Facebook friend. She has her business page there, but it has to be her friend because if you're her friend, you get to see her live cooking demos. When COVID started, you were, weren't you were doing them every day, every night? I did them every single day from uh, March the 17th. Which and I remember because it was St. Patrick's Day, and I, you know, was getting slowly getting the idea that COVID is going to change my life, not just the world's life. And uh, my husband came home on the night of the 16th and said he that his company had everybody going online, and he was going to be working at the dining room table from then on, and he still is. And although he went upstairs because I'm doing this and making too much noise, um, but um, I thought about it, and then I couldn't decide, and then I worried about things. And then I said, wait, it's St. Patrick's Day. I'm going to make soda bread. That'll make me do it. <laughs> so, and I just, I did it every day until, uh, until June. And Dara, I think I thought that it was, you know, that we were going to like get through it. Like here's this time, but then we're going to get on top of it. And I finally realized, you know, or, you know, the end of May, it's like, we're, you know, th this, this isn't, this isn't a sudden shocking thing that's happened. This is, this is our lives now. And so I, Decided, you know, I'm going to do it twice a week. Now I do it on Wednesdays and Saturdays, usually at three o'clock. And, um, you know, so that's... Everybody mark it down. Um, yesterday, we had fun, and I'm going to tie this in. Um, you were doing a cherry clafuti, and um, you didn't have cherries. I'm going to ask you to explain what a, what a clafuti is. Yeah. But you mentioned that in the story you saw the scopanong and the muscadine grapes. Yes. And uh, figs. Now, you have the book out, Southern Fruits, and it's yes. all about those items. So can you fill people in on one clafuti and the scopanong? I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. And the muscadine grapes and uh, figs. And there was um, something else, wild. Uh, wild persimmons are, that, they're on wild the cover. Wild persimmons. Okay. Go for it, Nancy. Well, Clafouti is, of course, not Southern. It's French. And I just happened to have my yesterday's Clafouti. This is, this is all that's left. Two people, folks. It's really good. Um, so Clafouti is a... A French dessert. It's a simple homey dessert. It's basically a custard, but not in a pie. It's eggs and flour, and it's three eggs, a half cup of milk, a half cup of flour. I'm sorry, three eggs, a half cup of flour, a half cup of sugar, and a cup and a quarter of milk. Makes a very simple custard. You can stir it up with a fork. It's thin, and it's it's in the tradition of popovers and waffles. You know how you have things, the Dutch baby, those pancakes. It has. It forms almost like a thin crust, and it's traditionally made uh, with cherries, fresh, sweet cherries, not sour cherries like we have in the South. Uh, the most traditional way would be to leave them unpitted to take off the stems, leave the pits in. French home cooks say that the pits have an almondy flavor that permeates. It's fine, and 
and there's a whole tradition of doing it with pitted cherries, but I couldn't find either one. And I, I had, of course, started out by looking up. I, I, I start out, if I'm doing a traditional dish, I look up like 10 or 15 recipes and then I print out, you know, five or seven of them so I can look at it and compare. And because I always want to see what's the traditional thing versus what one clever chef decided I'm going to do. Example, the reason I started thinking about Clafuti is uh, the, the magazine Local Palette featured uh, a buttermilk clafouti made with figs. And I said, wow, that's, I said, but buttermilk in a French dish? Well, that was their variation that they did a spin because they didn't want to do the same old thing. And it's not traditional to use figs, but of course it's made with fruit. So I found a raspberry one and I also made a blackberry one, which is here. This is the one. So I, so when I'm doing my, my cooking presentations, I make whatever it is ahead of time so that I've got one to show people at the end and I don't want you know people don't want to wait around 45 minutes for the one that I make on camera to be done but I found I could do it with raspberries you can do it with blackberries you can do it with with cherries I'm going to do it with figs I'm going to cut them in half and just place them cut side up and the grapes you mentioned muscadine and scuppernon grapes are a native grape of North Carolina um, they, they still grow wild. There's a Scuppernong River, which is the, where the name of the golden ones. So Muscadine is the family, and those are purple. And Scuppernong is a first cousin or a younger sister, and they're gold to green to bronze. They both have super thick skin. They're about the size of a big walnut or a small ping pong ball. <laughs> I, guess, I guess about the size of a ping pong ball. The skin is super thick, so country way, put it in your mouth, uh, bite down on it so that the pulp comes out. You throw away the skin. Some people chew it and eat it. You chew it up and get rid of the great big seeds. And it's just, you know, good, good home style eating. But women, of course, make a great whole pie using the skins and the pulp and they make jam and they make jelly and they make wine. So my fruit book, uh, which is it's called Fruit, a Savor South cookbook, is part of a series from UNC Press, the University of North Carolina Press. And they did mostly single ingredients. There's sweet potatoes and uh, okra and um, uh, pecans and tomatoes and peaches. And a few of them are a bigger subject. So mine was fruit. They told, at first they wanted me to do wild persimmons, muscadine, scuppernong grapes and um, figs. And I said, well, what about blackberries? And they said, okay, you can do blackberries too. And I said, well, um, what about strawberries? They're really old. <laughs> you know, pretty soon they cut me off at 12. And I did fruits that are iconic in the South. Some of them, like the scuppernong and muscadine grapes, are native to the South. And in, in fact, those are native to North Carolina. Mayhaws are native to Texas and Louisiana along the riversides. But then some like figs and um, uh, figs and pawpaws. Well, figs are came in with the Spanish colonizing Florida in the 1500s, and they loved the Southern climate and moved all the way up. Um, pawpaws are a wild fruit that grows in on the forest floor, and that's from Florida all the way up to Ohio. So I did uh, the 12 fruits. I did an introduction, uh, uh, sort of all about it and how it fits into Southern cooking. And then I did a few traditional dishes, but I also did, I'd, I'd call them inspired dishes, because it, it's not it's not a museum piece. It's not People used to make this, and we know why they don't make it anymore. It's, you know, here's some traditional things. Here's a fig pie. Here's a fig cake, Okra Coke Island fig cake. But then here's a um, fresh fig chutney that uh, my friend uh, Vimala of, of Vimala's Curry Blossom Cafe came up with a fig dish that has cumin in it. So, so bringing in things that Southerners and new Southerners are doing here and now. So it's a, so it's a book with the stories and also with about five recipes for each fruit. And it's, it's just my, my favorite kind of thing to do is kind of a, at heart, I'm really a social studies teacher, seventh and eighth grade social studies teacher. I want to be Miss Frizzle with a magic school bus and go to all the farmer's markets and go into the kitchen and find, you know, go to all the places and who makes what. And, you know, this is such an amazing time now because, you know, the, the whole world is here and you can just be, you know, be walking down a, 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 a small strip mall and here's an Afghan bread restaurant or, you know, and here's a, you know, here's a, a Chinese uh, pastry shop and here's a, a pupuseria. And I, I, I love that. And I love watching somebody whose food it is make that food and talk about what it is. Because, you know, when we write a recipe, so much of the life comes out of it. I'm giving you a formula, but you're not seeing 
the way that, you know, grandma lifts it up from the side or, or, you know, that last little pinch of something, those stories are what I love. That's what I love about video. You can capture so much that gets lost with the words. Well, I, I know that you're on your maternal side, it was a dairy farm and your grandmother. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, but your mother had a college degree, but she didn't like to cook. Nope. So you lived on TV dinners. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, she had, she had a, you know, she had a baby boomer mom repertoire, uh, meatloaf and um, salmon cakes. Um, she made, she made a spaghetti that was okay. Uh, but it just, it was just not of interest. It was, it was another chore. So when I took a shine to it, she was very glad to, say the cookbooks are over there and let me know when dinner's ready. I mean, that was, that, that was a, what a great match that it was something she didn't enjoy. And I was just crazy about learning. I mean, I, I would, we got, we had instant rice and I'd look on the back of instant rice and there was a recipe for rice pudding. And I never, I, I mean, maybe rice pudding is Southern. I, I don't think of it as Southern. It's not something that I ever remember seeing at a family reunion or a dinner on the grounds or any of my relatives houses, but I knew rice pudding because I read the pokey little puppy, the one of those little, little golden books and uh -huh. the naughty little puppy doesn't get rice pudding because he dawdles and comes home late. That would have been me. And so, the, you know, one of the first things I remember making and being thrilled about was rice pudding from the back of the instant rice box. But I feel like however you come to cooking, you know, that didn't stop me from, you know, learning how to make an absolutely traditional lane cake or researching Thai food and, you know, standing and, you know, taking notes because, you know, so many, so many traditional Thai recipes, the one, the home Thai, not traditional recipes, home cooking is something that doesn't always make it into the popular sphere. And the things that you see at a restaurant are the things that we like, you know, they're the things, you know, it's a, that's a business model, but I really fell in love with the sort of every day it was seasonal, it was local, it was regional cooking that my students who came from the countryside and I was, it's very typical at that time for uh, students from the countryside to, to come into town uh, Monday through Friday and live with a teacher and help out with chores in exchange for, you know, that was room and board. So I, I, while I lived two years in Thailand, I ate home style Thai food because that's what my students cooked. And I didn't, I had no intention of learning to cook it or writing a cookbook or anything. It was, but it was just an immersion in traditional Thai food that really served me well when I did decide, you know, I want to, I, I want to look at this. I want to step back and look at it and think about it. Well, you, you, you go from being raised in North Carolina where the spices are salt, pepper, and paprika, <laughs> yes! going paprika. to Thailand where there are chilies and flavors. You, your mind must have exploded. Absolutely. It's just, it's amazing. I love Southern food, but it's, it is a dull palate. The, we love the paprika because it has no, the paprika that is used on Southern deviled eggs is I think it has to be five years old because you know a woman buys one when she you know, when she starts, starts her old time. I mean, in my mother's generation, it was like you shake out a little bit, and I think one paprika jar from McCormick's would have lasted my mother <laughs> ten years. <laughs> it wasn't hot to begin no, with. No flavor left at all. Not even <laughs> exactly an aroma. Nothing. Before so, I forget, uh, Gail Nissen says hi, Nancy. Hey, Gail. And um, we do have a question here. Let's see. Were your cookbooks an instant success? How long did it take? How many books did you need to write before it became a meaningful business? Uh, that is a great question. All my books took a long time. I never had a hit. I never had a, like a big splash. In fact, when I started doing this, my first book came out in 1992 and nobody talked about a launch, <laughs> you know, even, and of course, so many people don't get a big fancy launch. I wouldn't have anyway, I, you know, for that book at that level. But, you know, nowadays people do their own, their own and you try to catch it. I, I think I'm really lucky because most of my books were with Chronicle Books and their policy was to have a strong backlist. So instead of being, say, a big, I mean, I went with them because they made me an offer. I don't mean to say I turned down all those big New York publishers, but right. I was lucky to get a contract. And I turned out to be lucky that it was with Chronicle because they had 
books that they put in print, they meant them to stay in print for a long time and make money that way, sort of a slow and steady model with lots of good things that are timeless. So Southern Cakes is a timeless book. It's not a, you know, it, it's not modern. It's not, you know, those little teeny incredible um, stacked up cakes that are so beautiful. It's not, it's not trendy. It was looking back with a little bit of history. The Thai book that I wrote, my, my book, Real Thai, it still works because I focused on traditional dishes that you would still see if you went to Thailand now. But people might come back and say, oh, we had this dish. Can you tell me how to make it? And I wouldn't know because, you know, I've been away from Thailand for 30 years. I don't remember, you know, there are things that have come right. about, ingredients that have become available that I wouldn't know. So because I've, because Chronicle didn't expect me to sink or swim in, you know, to, you know, nobody thought about quarters, you know, I, I didn't, there was no timeline on it. And so my book slowly and steadily built up and I have never made my living from my food work. I, I just, and I, I feel like I really want to say this to uh, people, especially women in the food business. Um, I'm able to do what I do because I am married to someone who has a real job with health insurance. We could get a mortgage and we, we have been so lucky to be able to have those basic life things taken care of. And then I can do this. When I had children, I was able to, you know, do more and do less with work and not have to jam them into the, you know, into the car seat on the cold morning. So I, I get it. And nobody even back then went into food writing because it was, you know, going to be the, the quick and easy money. And it's, you know, things change. They've changed out from under us. But I will say when people say you'll never make any money off your book, don't believe that. I'm, I'd am i say not all of them, but it, at least half of my books, I that sold out the advance. It might have taken three years. And then I started getting royalties. So twice a year I get um, I get I get royalty checks at the you know, there's January to June and you get that check in September coming up. And uh, June to December, you get that check March or April. And it's a su surprise. <laughs> you know, you never know what it's going to be. It's bonus money. <laughs> it, that's exactly right. And we, not enough bonus money to use it to buy a yacht. <laughs> but bonus money, you know, who's, who's ever sad to see that? And it mattered to me. I don't mean I didn't care about making money. But I mean, I didn't, I didn't need to go to work for a, you know, a food business publication in order to bring in X amount of income. And I know a lot of people do. And I think it is, I think it is so wonderful now that there's so many ways. I mean, all the, you know, women who started blogging and didn't know how to take pictures and then they learned and now they take magnificent food pictures and, you know, had, they've learned to do the internet. I've learned so much. I mean, I have a blog and it's, you know, I'm, I'm a real baby at it and not brilliant at it in any way. But the food blogging community is so generous and so kind. And you can just say, how do I do X? And it's like, oh, here's my, it's, it's such an incredible network. And I, I, feel, I feel that I really benefit from that. And now it's a time where people can say, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. I'm going to start a blog. I'm in, in this COVID time. How many people do we know who are doing Zoom classes or they've started a Patreon or they are um, doing, you know, doing online cooking classes where it's, you know, it's class by class. I mean, there's, this is a, it's a terrible time in terms of finding a job in food that is going to be secure, right. like, like anything is, but it's a magnificent time for there being so many ways that you can get in and, you know, really push hard. You may need to keep your day job, but there are really ways, products. I mean, you know, coming up with, I'm going to sell, I have a friend who just started doing beauty products. She's, she's a chef. She does um, has done like private chefing and so forth, but she's also come up with some skin things and I've ordered them and they're wonderful. So it's the best of times. It's the worst of times. And I got to tell you, Dara, I wanted to show something. Okay. So this is, so my husband is um, Taiwanese American. And so Chinese culture, we started going to Taiwan. Um, it's, it, his mom used to come over to visit us, but then she got older and we started taking our daughters and going to Taiwan almost every year. In fact, I, we, we had a trip to Taiwan that we postponed. We kept right. them, United Airlines has the money and we look forward to going. Um, but in Chinese culture, at Chinese New Year, you'll see red, you know, red, red Chinese characters with gold trim and it's prosperity. So it's putting, putting prosperous, positive thoughts in front of yourself. It's kind of, it's kind of choosing what to focus on. And I think during these times with so much that's hard, that's scary, that's out of control, that's unknown, um, I think it's really important 
to do that. And I've been, you know, keeping my Chinese characters handy. I mean, you, you can Google lucky Chinese characters and print one out on your, on your printer. Yeah. I've got a picture of a beautiful seaside that somebody sent me. And I just try to keep those handy to make sure that I don't, you know, go down the road. Go over hole. the edge. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because, aren't, I mean, we're all entitled to go right over that edge. And for me, doing my reading aloud and my, and cooking in every, every day, I hope, I hope it brings a little happiness to somebody or an idea for dinner to somebody. But I know it's been good for me because that's given me a little focus. This is something I can do. And that has helped me get through. So I, I let's, just. Let's tell everybody else what you do. You, um, Read children books for children, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you also talk about uh, social injustice. Uh, that's another talk that you give. And it seems sort of apropos. We're between Women's Equality Day yesterday and tomorrow was the anniversary. Tomorrow will be the anniversary of the Martin Luther King March. Uh, I have two questions. Yes. Two questions for you. And that's how I wrap up the show. What was your most epic culinary fail? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I would say the sort of the most recent embarrassing one was uh, on the last day of doing cooking every day. Like I announced a week ahead and said, you know, on on Sunday, I'm going to do my last one and then I'm going to go to twice a week. And I came up with this cake, uh, a cake in a square pan. I'm, you know, for this for this time, I'm always trying to think of what can regular people do and not make it something fancy. It's like, look what I can make. You can't make it. Um, so uh, a one layer cake in a square pan. Then I cut it in half and cut the halves in half crossways. And I had four skinny layers and I made a blackberry um creamy blackberry icing, an old timey one with a, with a, it's called a roux frosting and it was purple with blackberries and I put it together and I iced it. And then I decided that I would move it from the cutting board where I had carelessly left it over to the beautiful platter that I had brought out. And my husband was standing next to me with the platter and I lifted it up and dumped it upside down onto the platter and you know wh what are they going to do fire me <laughs> it was pretty <laughs> embarrassing and not what I had in mind but it turned out to be an epic fail in that I was able to give an epic lesson that a, a number of people commented on probably much more so they might say that's nice I'd never make that cake but I I said hang on I went in the next room and I got my uh trifle bowl and cut the cake up and lined it and talked about, you know, you may, I'm going to make a custard sauce. I'm going to make whipped cream. I'm going to put in a layer of blackberries. And then, you know, then later I, you know, later I posted that because when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. I don't, right. I don't think Julia Child actually dropped a chicken, but if she had, she would have rinsed it off and, and put it back in. <laughs> and and going forward. Get rid of. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So my last question is I'm going to do a commercial and give you a chance to think about it. What question didn't I ask you that I should have? And to wrap up, uh, seek treatment for drug and alcohol addiction and co-occurring mental health disorders by calling Amadis Recovery Centers at 833-631-0525. Uh, we're wrapping up with one of my favorite cookbook authors and crazy lady, Nancy McDermott. You can find her at nancymcdermott.com. All right, Nancy, what question didn't I ask you that I should have? I would say, how do you keep smiling and stay happy with so much that is going terribly, terribly wrong Our, to all the people in, on the Gulf Coast and all the people in California and all the people in New York and all over the world and everywhere and black people with police violence and all the things that are um, that are in front of us now. Um, it just seems like we can't get through the day without, you know, clutching our hearts 10 times. Um, I think about people who were brave, who endured worse things than I personally have had to endure thus far. And I think about focusing on this moment and what can I do? What can I put into the world, you know, right now, in this moment, and it may be to take a break and just go sit outside and watch the butterflies go after my uh, Rosa Sharon bush, 
or it may be to go call a friend or it's not, it's not easy. I'm not happy all the time. And so if you see me cooking and I've got a big smile, that's because I enjoy cooking. But when I'm down, sometimes I cook because that's something I do. So I think that it's important to remember that it's not about not being sad. It's about taking care of ourselves and um, make sure that we're choosing, you know, choosing to come back to the sun rose this morning and somebody just had a new baby and somebody just got a new kitten and what can I do to make things a tiny bit better somewhere or just take a nap? <laughs> Nancy, we're going to have to do this again sometime. I would love and it. I, I didn't even touch being in the, at the white house in the Rose garden. Cause that's oh a whole God. other subject. Remember <laughs> yes. when we were there? And, Very clearly. Uh, and I shared a, a cronut with you in New York. Yes. In yes. New York city. Thanks to Don Odiorn. The, From, the potato yes. guy. Yes. High the up and yes. high rise. Right. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Was I'll be watching your cooking show. All right, everyone. I have a couple notes. Uh, Nancy and I just tend to talk quite a bit and don't miss her. Friend her on Facebook. Then you'll get to see the live cooking demos. That's N-A-N-C-I-E. I want to say congratulations to the Charmery Ice Cream people. The, um, they are doing their seventh anniversary, the Alamas. And going through August 30th, they have seven special flavors to honor their theme wanderlust, strawberry hibiscus and mezcal ice cream from Mexico, England, a banana biscuit and toffee bit ice cream, Japan, a yuzu, rhubarb and pistachio, and Italy, a tiramisu and a couple other flavors. So congratulations to them. The Gordon Center presents Cooking with author Leah Koenig, who does the Jewish cooking book, and she's going to be doing a cooking class on holiday sweets September 1st uh, at 6 p.m. If you're a member of the uh, Gordon Center and JCC, I believe it's $10, $15 for non-members. I want to thank you for watching the show and sharing it with your friends. This will be up on Jay Moore's Facebook page for perpetuity. It'll go up on the jmoreliving.com a little later today and on YouTube. If you want to reach me, you can reach me at food at Jmore Living. My social media is at Dara Cooks. Be safe. Wear your mask. And... May your plates always, always remain full. Thank you again for joining.